This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. Visit www.iasc-commons.org slash membership dash options. Hello, everyone. My, my name is Charlie Schleich, um, and welcome to the International Association of the Study of the Commons First World Commons Week 24-hour noon webinar series. Uh, we're about halfway through the day. We're now at UTM minus one. Um, so this is our 13th uh, webinar in a row. Uh, and um, I'd like to uh, welcome our speakers, or and uh, I believe there's a paper behind this uh, presentation, but uh, Brent Never, Brenda Bushhouse, and Rob Christensen. And you can see the talk title on your screen. Um, in the interest of getting straight to the talk, we've asked our distinguished webinar speakers to um, introduce themselves and, their, and advise them that their talk needs to go no more than 35 minutes. So I'm gonna act as the timer and I'll provide a verbal re reminder when they have five minutes left for the talk. And then the last 10 minutes will be left for question and answers. And so for the, uh, the attendees, if you scroll your mouse down on the Zoom screen, you'll see that there's a Q&A button. Uh, you can hit that Q&A and that gives you the ability to enter questions you might have. Uh, you do not have the ability to speak. Uh, I will read the questions to the panelists for you. And um, for people that are uh, connecting via phone, you can uh, dial star nine, which will raise your hand on the webinar system. I'll see that. And in that case, I will unmute you and let you ask your question to the panelists directly. Uh, so let's, let's start. Uh, thanks, uh, Brent, Brenda, and Rob for, uh, for uh, giving this talk. Great. Great. Well, thanks, Charlie, for uh, setting this up. And, and uh, you know, this is such a cool idea. I was trying to explain it to, to my colleagues, and they were just trying to figure out the time zone. So this is uh, the fact that you can, you can keep track of, of all of these time zones is, is really impressive. So I'm Brent Never. I'm an associate professor of public affairs at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, I've been here for, for nine years. Um, but my research um, kind of spans a, a few different uh, fields, but in, for, for today's sake, uh, it really deals with how we can apply some of the logic from the quote unquote Bloomington School of Scholars um, and uh, go ahead and, um, and apply it uh, to, to different fields that, that might not have been uh, used by the Ostrom, Ostroms in the past. Um, and, and with that, how about um, I'll, I'll let Brenda, if she's there, introduce herself and then I can introduce Rob. Great. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. This is really exciting. I just, I think I'd add to that that, um, well, let me introduce myself and then I want to add to something that Brent said. Uh, I'm Brenda Bushhouse. I'm from University of Massachusetts. I have a joint appointment in political science and the School of Public Policy, and I study the politics of nonprofit organizations. But I just wanted to say that when Rob, Brent, and I have been working together for a few years now, Brent, so mm -hmm. time has gone by. Yeah. We have, um, we started out and we did a special issue of nonprofit and vector, voluntary sector quarterly it was in 2016, it's volume 45, 4S. And in that, all the articles we're trying to combine uh, are used tools from the Ostrom workshop at Indiana University, developed by Eleanor Ostrom and colleagues, and apply them to phenomena that we study as nonprofit and voluntary action scholars. And so that began this, this um, discussion. And then we went to the International Association for the Study of the Commons, uh, conference last year and presented some work and then we continued to develop it and Rob and Brent were at the uh, Internet ISTAR, International Society for Third Sector Research, this past summer in Amsterdam 
and we're submitting a, uh, this paper to the International Journal of the Commons. So we've been working together for a while. We're really interested in getting more nonprofit and voluntary action scholars and common scholars talking to one another. So Brent's gonna do the presentation today. Thank you, Brent, and welcome no, everyone. No problem. Well, and, and just to give a, a quick uh, intro to our, our third colleague, uh, Rob Christensen, he's at Brigham Young University. He is at the Marriott School of Management, and um, he's a scholar, also has a wide range of, of interests, but he too uh, is, is really interested in this Bloomington School of, of Thought. Um, you know, more narrowly, but more largely creating this dialogue uh, across different different fields. So to um, start, I, I would like to, to uh, point you to the MVSQ, Nonprofit and Voluntary Sector Quarterly Special Issue that we, we did two years ago. It, it tried so to Brent, bridge. Brent, sorry to interrupt you. I just, um, we've had a, a Several people joined since we started, oh. and I just want to remind the people that just joined in that you can ask questions through the Q&A button in the bottom of Zoom, and, and I will moderate those questions, but okay, sorry to interrupt, Brett. No, it's all right, absolutely. So, so that special issue of, of Nonprofit and Voluntary Sector Quarterly was uh, our first attempt to start to speak to um, to nonprofit scholars. So largely, the three of us work in this world of nonprofit and voluntary action studies. Um, and, you know, they did not necessarily understand what uh, the Bloomington School was. Um, and we'll explain what we think that is today. And, um, and we, we really were interested in, in pushing boundaries. We all know that we, we live in a society of very complex problems that easily go across our traditional uh, academic disciplines. And therefore, we need to be comfortable engaging in material that we might not know. Um, so that was the impetus for this discussion here of, okay, we've talked to one group of scholars, now let's try to speak across a, another boundary um, to common scholars. And that's really where, where we are um, with this, this paper and this presentation. So first thing um, that we find to be really important is, is the multidisciplinarity that is inherent with understanding social and ecological problems. Um, you know, so if, if you think about uh, Lynn Ostrom in, in Governing the Commons, uh, she really grappled with uh, issues of fisheries, irrigation, um, aquifers, the like, and the real uh, thorny questions of how you deal with an ecological problem, but also you add the human element of, of governing um, that sort of resource. Uh, and, and so it, it would make sense that you wouldn't only have, say, environmental scientists on one hand, or say only political scientists on the other hand, it would make sense that we, we all talk across that, that divide. So what we're articulating in our paper though, is from the angle of voluntary and nonprofit action. So for those of you who don't understand or, or kind of work in this field, um, nonprofit and voluntary sector uh, studies are, are about 50 years old as, as a, a formed field. Although we're very multidisciplinary, like uh, common scholars, we have folks who are from um, sociology, anthropology, uh, political science, law, economics. Uh, we, we largely are in the social sciences, though. Our main uh, international society is, is um, ISTAR, as, as Brenda referenced earlier, but also um, in the U.S. it's called ARNOVA. Um, these are growing very rapidly because uh, I think we would art articulate as, as co-authors the idea that third sector 
um, or a third way of dealing with social issues are really important. Um, so if, if you think about this, this idea of a Bloomington school, what it was largely um, is that if you think of a continuum of, of answers to public problems or answers to problems, I should say, on one end, uh, you have market solutions. So, you know, this is tends to be where economists play. Uh, so, you know, if I'm hungry and I want a hamburger, then uh, McDonald's will be there to serve my, my hunger needs. Um, and then on the other end of the continuum, we have government. So um, if I'm hungry uh, and I don't have money to pay for a hamburger, I'm, I'm impoverished. Uh, in a lot of um, countries, we have a welfare state where government will uh, fill that market failure and they'll either give me a, a, a lunch or they'll pay for me to, to get that lunch. Um, so traditionally, there's been these two poles and two ways of answering this question of, of societal needs. Um, and the Bloomington School, and, and largely championed by Lynn Ostrom and, and her husband Vincent, is that there's this middle zone of voluntary solutions uh, to problems. Um, now, it might not be as so trite as, as a hamburger for lunch, but, you know, why limit ourselves to, to either market or state? Because both of those have imperfections. So as voluntary action scholars, we're very interested in uh, voluntary solutions to a, a full range of problems. Uh, you know, Brenda has worked on early childhood education. I've worked on um, poverty and poverty alleviation. Um, you know, the, the, these concepts can certainly extend way beyond uh, what we traditionally think of as, as public problems. So, so largely, this is where the, the pool in which we swim. Um, so when we think about how we would present this material to common scholars, we would say that, um, listen, listen, common scholars, uh, we study a lot of similar things. We study collective voluntary action. So how do people get together, decide on how they're going to govern any sort of resource? Um, and how do they do that without uh, government telling them what to do? So that's the first thing we, we tend to study. Um, the, the second thing we tend to study is this use of both non-market and non-state mechanisms for addressing problems. Um, in the United States and in, in Western Europe, there's a, a vibrant, you know, um, voluntary sector where it's, it's people who've come together um, either in very small organizations going from uh, chess clubs and church basement, uh, food pantries and the like, all the way to very, very large organizations, the International Red Cross, uh, the Red Crescent, um, you know, you think of Harvard University with a $38 billion endowment. These are all uh, in this space that we're talking about here. Um, so it, it's a very complicated uh, area, but they're all in this space of non-market, non-state. And lastly, uh, we sort of articulate the idea that our field is very interested in how we contour organizational form to fit the nature of communities problems. So the, um, the flexibility of, of voluntary sector solutions is really one of the, the nice things about it. Government can be a one size fits all sort of solution um, and, and market can have all sorts of, of market failures. So we like our, our middle zone as is, is being a, a good solution. So, uh, we have this very, very interdisciplinary uh, group of folks uh, at our, our meetings uh, every year. We have at ARNOVA 
maybe 1,000 to 1,200 scholars, uh, which is growing phenomenally every single year. Um, so with this openness and new perspectives, we really wanted to um, take this challenge up of, of Eleanor Ostrom in her Nobel Prize um, speech in 2009. And she said, we need to consider non-market, non-state solutions. Um, and that's, that's where, where we play. So this here is, is probably uh, something that, that you know um, very well, but I'll, I'll go through it quickly only for maybe the folks on the line who have not uh, had it before. So I see a few folks I know who uh, I invited and this is not necessarily their field. So, you know, uh, very quickly, the Commons defined uh, Garrett Hardin, 1968, um, uses the, the concept of a, uh, a traditional English Commons um, where you have pasturage. Um, the community can all use it. There's no fence around it, so anybody can access it at any time. Uh, the major problem with the Commons is that if uh, my sheep eat the grass, that means that grass isn't available for your sheep. So if we all have equal access to that pasturage, um, we would have an incentive to consume before somebody else's consumes. And this creates this ever worsening cycle of overconsumption, which can lead to the depletion of a commons. And, and typically they've been used in, in fisheries, aquifers, forests, um, but also there's a, a really cool, um, you know, tweak and recently where we're talking about intellectual commons, uh, kind of uh, commons that are a, a little bit further afield than um, what Hardin was, was talking about. So um, we sort of, you know, are, are forced through this idea of thinking through uh, this two by two matrix of different types of goods. You have private, public, um, toll goods or club goods and, and CPRs, and they all have problems associated with them. Uh, private goods, you know, um, some of the problems are contract failure, uh, over exclusion, um, you know, uh, moral hazard and, and the like. Uh, public goods, we have uh, very real problems with inefficiency of allocation um, and, and fundamentally non-representation of, of people's wants and needs. Um, government can be a, a big organization and not always do what people want. Toll goods or club goods, you know, we have a, a major problem with over exclusion. People can't access the local country club if you're using that as a literal metaphor. And lastly, common pool resources are prone to overuse. So um, the Ostrom governing the common certainly was interesting common pool resources. Um, but there is a full range of, of solutions to this tragedy of the commons. Hardin really articulated the need for state action um, and a, a, a very forceful state action to commons problems. Uh, others have articulated a, a very strong market uh, solution. We play in that middle zone. So I wanted to articulate why we like common scholars and not just trying to speak to the crowd here, but, but um, you know, some of us are, are married to them, but, um, but also, you know, commons are, are intellectually really interesting to us. Um, they are, um, you know, this, this problem where we, if we started to really think about it in the nonprofit and voluntary sector area, we do actually have a lot of commons problems, but we don't label it that. And maybe because of that, we don't get intellectual purchase on what we are trying to study. Um, and I'll give you a few examples in, in a minute, but, um, you know, uh, as, as Ostrom in the you know, 1980s was really struggling with inadequate tools for addressing what she saw as very important problems, 
I think Rob and Brenda and myself struggled also with the idea that we have some very fundamental problems in our field that we, we really have a tough time even intellectually articulating. Um, so, you know, that was exciting to us. The second thing that was exciting is that the commons literature has been interdisciplinary from the very beginning. Um, you know, Garrett Hardin uh, articulated the fact that, you know, you can't just study this as an environmental problem. You need to understand this as a, a human problem um, and, and this connection between the two. So that's very exciting for us. I think it's also exciting to think about bringing in uh, new scholars who are not in the voluntary action fold in our traditional area, and that tends to be environmental uh, scientists, natural scientists, uh, who don't necessarily come to ARNOVA or ISTAR, um, but I think could, could really add some depth to, to what we're trying to, to understand. And then um, clearly you also are in a field that's growing tremendously um, with the, you know, the advent of the International Association of the Study of the Commons and then you know, 10, 11 years of the International Journal of the Commons. Um, clearly, this is a, a vibrant play box where, or sandbox where, where we would like to get in on the, the fun and games too. So that's, that's where we're coming from. So we did in, in this paper um, a, a very, you know, uh, quick bibliometric analysis. Um, we looked at all of the issues of the International Journal of the Commons. Uh, because we were really trying to see if there's reference to the sorts of things that we tend to talk about in voluntary action studies. Um, we had a, a series of keywords. Here are some uh, NGO, non-governmental, non-profit, not-for-profit, or um, voluntary. So these are some of the keywords where we had the most success. Um, and we, we use this bibliometric um, work in previous work we've done. So we feel pretty confident in, in what we were able to find. Um, and, and what we're showing here is the percent of the total pages in those 11 years of the International Journal of the Commons, the percentage of pages that ref reference one of these, these key terms. There's a lot of problems with a bibliometric analysis like this, and we fully engage that. Um, but what I will say is Brenda in particular, but Rob also then did a, a check, meaning they pulled down all of the articles um, over this 11 year period and combed through those articles, particularly those that they hit on these search terms to make sure that we're catching what we think we're catching. So there was a second layer of this process so we can feel very confident in, in that. In that process, I would argue, and um, I, I, I'd let Brenda speak to that, um, was, was a very good process for us, the, the second layer, because what we were then able to see is that um, common scholars, if and when they, they referenced uh, these, these search terms, use them in slightly different ways than, than we would as voluntary action scholars. And we thought, this is the hook. This is where this discussion, this discussion, sorry, discussion can start to happen um, around the idea of uh, how we use these terms and employ them. You know, in in Commons uh, research, you use other terms that we found that refer to things that we do study: uh, user groups. Um, you know, communities, the like. These, these are things that we're very interested in. It's just we attach slightly different verbiage to them. All right, so, you know, this is, this is with a huge caveat that we are not all knowing and, and we try to be humble in, in this paper. Um, and, and I know that, that my co-authors are very, very humble in, in articulating this. 
Um, but we, we, in this paper, say, well, there are three kind of big lessons that we have um, found in, in kind of building this bridge. Um, and we humbly think that, that we could engage this. So the, the first lesson that we go into, we spend a lot of time on these three, is that nonprofit and voluntary organizations are not unitary, meaning they're not just a black box or a unitary actor. Um, so, so we, uh, for each of these, bring forward a few of the IJOC articles and say, look at how a scholar used these terms. And that's not right or wrong, we're not saying that, but this is how a voluntary action scholar might use these terms. So. Um, this Chowdhury et al. 2015 is an article about Nepal, about a very small fishery in a, a mountain village um, that had become polluted and, and had many, many issues. And um, Chowdhury actually, uh, and, and co-authors, do a really nice job thinking about this interplay of, they call them 15 levels. They have this national government, they have international NGOs, they have national NGOs, they have regional NGOs, they have a local fishermen's group, they have a community uh, of elders, they have all sorts of, of levels. And um, they were good at, at saying these are all actors. Now, what we would say as nonprofit and voluntary action uh, scholars is that it's important to say that there is a difference between an international NGO, for example, and a Nepalese NGO. Um, they're both founded and incorporated in different jurisdictions. An international NGO, for example, might be incorporated in the UK. Um, which has a wholly different set of laws and constraints. Um, and therefore, it might act entirely differently than a Nepalese uh, uh, NGO. So we need to crack open each of these organizational forms to see why they're acting in some what confounding sorts of ways. And that's what a, a nonprofit uh, scholar might do. Um, the, the second uh, point or lesson is that, you know, nonprofit and voluntary organizations exist in this really dense matrix of constraint that shapes their action. So, um, you know, one of the, the aspects we were seeing in some of these articles, and in, in this goes with the black box idea, is that uh, there were scholars were kind of positing fairly linear uh, pathways for organizations and how they acted. So um, this, this is the problem, they entered, they fixed the problem. Or this is the problem, they entered, they collaborated with another organization, they collectively fixed the problem. Well, uh, I, I think one of the, the hallmarks of our literature is that um, you know, these organizations are beholden to so many stakeholders. Um, it's, it's not like private sector organizations where you have uh, just the, the market, um, you may have equity stakeholders and the like. With nonprofits, you have uh, statutory requirements. So you have requirements from, from governments. You have requirements from uh, funders and funders can be broken down into government or state funders. They can be broken down into uh, philanthropists. They can be broken down into um, foundations or, or also lastly, um, kind of corporate money. All of these different uh, stakeholders are, are important. And then you have to talk about what we would think, I, to speak for Brenda and she can correct me, is the most important stakeholders, which are the kind of consumers or users of, of whatever this, this organization is, is doing. Um, so it's, it's a complex brew of, of actors in there. And you can't just say that, well, there are these rational unitary sort of actors. They're, they're very much um, non-unitary and somewhat seemingly irrational if you try to view them as unitary. 
And and lastly, you know, and, and this I think was was uh, where Rob really um, gravitated towards this this idea, which was we have a very well developed scholarship around voluntary action, particularly dealing with philanthropic and um, voluntary behavior. So so let's crack that open for a minute. Um, one way that a lot of these organizations get funded is through philanthropy. That's individuals giving resources um, or foundations or corporations giving resources to these, these organizations. Uh, in the United States, there's a vibrant um, philanthropic culture, but also um, there are vibrant philanthropic cultures around the world. Um, but we said, hey, you could think of the money that that people give to organizations as a commons um you know there's a, a limited amount of it but often there's so many asks of people to give money it's almost like there's no fence around the pasture right there's no uh fence around all the people trying to get your your philanthropic resource your dollar your euro your whatever um, and so we could start to, to layer on ideas of commons onto uh, our current literature on philanthropy. And then the- so Brent, just, just to cut in, you've got about five minutes left for the talk, okay? Perfect, perfect. Uh, you know, the second, the second one is voluntary uh, action. And, and similarly, a lot of these organizations exist um, by the use of uh, volunteers. Volunteers, again, have a, a limited uh, amount of hours in the day and a limited amount of ability to, uh, you know, put their human capital into uh, an issue. And they have a lot of asks of their time. So should we think of volunteers as, as um, commons or their time as, as commons? So we, we see a nice entrance here into a dialogue. So, you know, why should we as nonprofit scholars be concerned about common scholars? Well, these two authors, Jeff Brodney and Lucas uh, Misch, in 2009 used commons as a language for thinking about volunteerism. Traditionally, we've thought of volunteers as a private good, and they said, no, we need to think of them as a CPR. You can overuse them and burn them out and have them never come back. So um, let's think about how we govern volunteers. Uh, and, and we say, well, we could think about, again, philanthropy, volunteers. In some cases, you can think about organizational budgets as a common, depending on how the, the organization views its budget. Um, but in some of these less formed uh, nonprofits uh, where there's not good controls about who can access budgets, uh, I would argue that you, you could see a uh, commons uh, action there. So, um, you know, we also are pushing our, our friends to think about looking at nesting of rules and understanding seemingly irrational altruistic behavior because there's a rich literature out there that we traditionally have not engaged. So um, in, in kind of, following and, and, and concluding, we really enjoy common scholars because they hold three sort of values that are important and we, we kind of miss. One is the nature of the good is essential for understanding governance. Um, in, in voluntary action studies, I would say that sometimes we aren't very coherent or clear in, in how we, we understand the good we're actually talking about. Um, secondly, the natural world matters, even something like, you know, volunteerism. So, you know, I, I was just on a sabbatical at Arizona State in the American Southwest. You know, you need to think about how uh, people develop around natural ecological systems that then leads to how they organize themselves in other aspects of their lives. And, and lastly, we love the idea of engaging this idea of complexity and complex adaptive systems um, where linear answers are not always uh, sufficient. 
Um, so with that, you know, we're, we're excited to, to be here with you today. Uh, I've, I've talked for half an hour and um, I am very happy with Brenda and Brenda is going to field questions uh, and, and answer any you might have. So, so Brent, this is Charlie, uh, the moderator. Uh, maybe at this point you can stop sharing your screen. Yep. yep. And Brenda, if you want to put the video on. Uh, um, thank you so much for the talk. The, uh, the, the participants can't clap. I'm going to clap for everybody <laughs> on behalf of that. Um, and now uh, we've got a hard deadline at quarter of the hour, but we have, um, again, for anybody who joined late, uh, we have a, um, a Q&A window. You can type in your questions um, to the speakers. Um, and uh, let me read the first one. Uh, do you feel it is possible to get past the messiness of different structures and agendas to establish more three sector efforts to address complex problems that have been around for many years? I'm going to actually copy this question and put it in chat so uh, you can see it um, as well and digest it. Sure. And in the meantime, while they're digesting and preparing to answer that question, uh, attendees, feel free to ask questions and I'll moderate. So Sal, I think that's a great question. And Sal's done great work on philanthropy. Um, and so I would hope so. I think it's difficult in the kind of market stake dichotomy that we face for the civil society to get its attention that it deserves. So um, one thing I think that's great about combining efforts with common scholars is we can raise the profile because we, the three of us, Rob, Brent, and I see these areas where we could draw on each other's scholarship to advance knowledge and build both fields. And so I would hope that as we're able to um, kind of co-produce <laughs> scholarship, to use uh, Lynn's concept, um, that we'll be able to elevate uh, the important work that's neither market nor state. Brent, did you want to add to that? That's, I agree completely, uh, Brenda. I, I think that um, we have to engage this, this messiness of these three sector efforts, because if you, if you think about it, uh, governments, are, are largely shrinking as far as what they, what they do. State action is largely shrinking. Welfare states are, are shrinking. Um, you know, uh, the voluntary sector, philanthropy and giving is, is, you know, important, but it's not large as far as a, a portion of the American GDP, for example. And then there's the market out there with all of its failures. And so we have to engage this all of these um all of these these issues across you know um the 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 divide so you know with that said um it's it's yet maybe another set of papers that we should all think about in breaking down uh in bridging towards say for example our business co colleagues Terrific. So again, uh, attendees, if you have questions, use the question and answer. Okay, one, uh, we've got two coming in. I'll take the second one first. Um, do you think community resource is a form of common pool resource that has been overused or under uh, overexploited as exemplified by economic inequality, such that the nonprofit sector kicks in to manage or reallocate part of a Part of community resources to the needed. Um, I'm going to copy that to chat again, uh, but feel free to jump in, speakers. Um, I'm putting the question in chat. I'll, I'll go, Brenda, you're on mute. Um, I just wanted to clarify maybe what community resource, the meaning of that, because um, community resource can mean a lot of thing, a lot of different things. So I kind of need a little bit of clar clarity on that. Um, but I do, if we're thinking about um, what governments decide to do or not to do, and what private sector decides to do or not to do, the, we have a, 
I have to go back to Lester Solomon on this one in terms of we have different failures and one of market failure, government failure, but then also voluntary failure. And so when we, we when if we're thinking about community resource about what's available that's neither market nor state, then we have some areas that get a lot of attention and then some that don't. Um, and so I think that the it's some sometimes it's the case that the voluntary step steps in when there's market failure or government failure, but there's also times where the voluntary sector was first. Okay, and then it shifts in the other way, but in different societies, different systems, you have different things that fall through the cracks. And so that's one of the concerns I have is what's falling through the cracks. So I just opened up the mute for the questioner, Viviana, in case um, there was any clarification. Viviana, you can talk. Okay, maybe that's, oh, huh, saying I'm, it's, I'm gonna unmute. Now, sorry. Viviana, can you, do you have any follow-up? Okay, I try, that didn't work technically, sorry. <laughs> um, go ahead and put in Q&A if you have a follow-up on that. Uh, um, but I, I do think that's interesting. I, 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 I encourage Viviana to kind of either put in a, a Q&A or, or, or contact us because I think Brenda, Rob, and myself, and, and a lot of scholars are really interested in, in thinking through how we articulate things like community resources, um, which can, as Brenda said, can be articulated in so many ways. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly different communities are at a point where they have overused certain resources. And I'm not talking natural resources. I'm talking about, you know, uh, how, how they engage with, with public problems, right? So they've overextended, they've over leaned on philanthropy, they've over leaned on uh, the state. So I've, I'm from Toledo, Ohio originally, which is a rust belt city where, you know, you have um, uh, the, the government is atrophied because they don't have resources and it's just um, the philanthropy is dried up because the major corporations have left town. It, they're still the same public problems and, and even worse, but less ability to engage them. Um, and that's, that's really something that is not just Toledo, Ohio. It's, it's many cities, um, I'd imagine, across the world. So I just saw Viviana's uh, follow-up. And I do think, it, 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 just speaking in, you know, we've got an election coming up in the United States, so I'm really focused on thinking about that. But I've been talking with my political science colleagues, and in some of the research, people have lost the ability to speak to one another. You know, we've all heard about these bubbles. And so your follow-up question about looking at how people govern the society on their own is critically important, I think, right now. It's such an important question as people, as new technologies have allowed us to go into our own bubbles, reinforcing bubbles. And we have to think, okay, what level of community are we talking about? Are we talking about our virtual communities? Are we talking about the one, the places in which we physically live? Um, you know, which communities are we focusing on? And, but I think, you know, a lot of um, uh, the nonprofit and voluntary action scholarship looks at, well, why do people give? Why do people volunteer? And maybe some of the questions that we need to be asking about are thinking about these as commons, and then what are the governance arrangements that are going to help us preserve those commons and develop those commons so that they're not depleted? So we're at about the hard deadline point. We've got about a minute left. Uh, and so I think I'm gonna stop it now so we can get to the next noon hour webinar. Um, but uh, one of the reactions I had that I just wanted to toss out given we've got um, people from both communities, uh, the commons community and the you know, voluntary action community on the, on the line is I think this was a really important webinar contribution um, because it is making those connections between these two communities, these two scholarly communities. And um, just having this webinar led me to an idea I just wanted to toss out. Um, knowing our NOVA is coming up, maybe uh, there could be a conversation there. Um, 
you know, we, we, we of course physically go to our disciplinary conferences, our, uh, the physical conferences, but um, this platform that we're using today clearly shows that we could have these cross field dialogues with um, uh, less transaction costs for meeting up. And so I just wanna to toss out the idea that maybe we consider in 2019 or well, sometime in the next year, perhaps trying a virtual conference between Arnova and IASC. Um, and, and maybe we could continue that dialogue after that. But I, I just think this is an opportunity to bridge disciplines with, uh, you know, in an easier way than trying to meet up physically in person somewhere. So um, on behalf Hello. of I, yeah, go ahead, Brenda. Quickly say, so Rob, Brent, and I are all going to be at Arnova. And some subset of us is, or maybe all three of us are going to be at the ISC conference this summer in Peru. So if you're on this call and want to continue dialogues, please come up to us at any of those conferences and, you know, let's, let's make some time to talk. And actually, uh, Brenda or Brett, open up chat and if you can type in quickly your email addresses, or I know, Brett, you had a slide with them um, just as we close um, for anybody who might want to contact you after this. Uh, but let me, as we're closing, let me on behalf of the International Association for the Study of the Commons and all of the World Commons Week organizers, um, let me thank the attendees for taking their time, whether it be at noon or some other time zone that you're, you're uh, joining us from. And let me make a special thanks to the, to the speakers, the, the paper authors, Brent, Brenda, and Rob for uh, taking the time to put this together in the effort. And uh, I, I personally found it very valuable and, I, and I, I'm sure others on the call uh, also did. In closing, I'd just like to remind everyone that um, there's two upcoming IESC events. One is in November, mid-November, uh, which is the first virtual conference. It's about a month away. And then in July, 2019, the IESC is holding their in-person conference in Lima, Peru. The deadline for papers was just um, extended to November 15th. So uh, uh, perhaps somebody um, uh, on the call would be interested in um, submitting an abstract. Um, you can find out more information on that by going to worldcommons, worldcommonsweek.org. Um, right at the top left are links to both of those events. And on behalf of IASC, and the organizers, um, we just really appreciate you taking your time today and joining us. So with that, I'm going to close the, the meeting and uh, have a great rest of the day, whatever time zone you're in. Cheers.